Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. If you're joining us on YouTube, thanks for stopping by. We'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to our channel for more videos on all things aphasia. This is Ask the Expert with Michael and Carolyn Nobelomia. He'll be talking with us today about my, Michael's book, Finding My Words and how poetry has supported his journey with aphasia. I'll be your moderator for this hour long session. My name is Jen. I'm part of the team at the National Aphasia Association, a nonprofit organization that provides access to research, education, rehabilitation, therapeutic and advocacy services to individuals with aphasia and their care partners. On today's agenda, we'll be hearing from Michael and Carolyn, then we'll open up the floor to those in our live audience for questions. And now I am honored to introduce our panelists, Michael obel Omiya and Carolyn obel Omiya. Michael is a seasoned educator, public speaker, and author. Dr. Kel Carolyn obel Omiya, an accomplished professor, and Michael's wife and care partner. Michael and Carolyn, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This is very exciting. Very nervous, but very exciting. <laughs> thank you. We have some really great friends in our audience, so no need to be nervous. <laughs> Um, I'm going to pass it over to Michael and Carolyn, but again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A chat. Okay, now we are back on the screen. Here we go. Okay, I'm Michael Obel Omiya, and um, well, this is about aphasia. I was born uh, 21 May, uh, <laughs> January 1966. But on 21 May, 2016, I had a stroke, an ischemic stroke. And uh, it took about two or three days that I had aphasia. I had no idea what aphasia is, but I had it. Um, and I'm Carolyn Obelamia. Thank you for your introduction, Jen. Um, I, I did wanna start by recognizing the recent news about um, Bruce Willis being diagnosed with aphasia and just take this opportunity to express um, our um, support to him, and it also uh, the the message that um, a diagnosis of aphasia is not just to the person with aphasia, but to the family. And um, so I just I just I wish him in the best him the best um, with the support of his family in his aphasia journey. And also that Michael and I have really been welcomed into an amazing community of people who have aphasia and their supporters. Um, so um, to sort of welcome into that community as well, because we've met some incredibly inspiring, uh, wonderful people. So our plan is to, Michael's gonna tell his story about having his stroke and um, um, his experience with aphasia, um, and then move into reading five or six of his poems, and then we'll, open it up for questions. That's great. So uh, I'm Michael <laughs> Obel Omiya, and I was an educator. In 1988, I taught at Perky Oman School in Pennsburg, Pennsylvania, and I was teaching everything. I was teaching English and uh, football and baseball and wrestling, and I loved it. For two years, I went to Roxbury Latin School from 1990 to 2006, 16 years. I was at Roxbury Latin, I loved it. I taught English and I taught Dean of Students, uh, Director of Admissions. Uh, I taught um, wrestling, and varsity baseball and lacrosse and a little football. It was great at everything at Roxbury Latin. After that, I went to university school in uh, Hunting Valley, Ohio, where I was director of upper school and um, I loved it there too. Uh, after uh, university school, I taught at William Penn Charter in uh, Philadelphia under Dr. Ford and Paul Cuppy School in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. I was the head of school there. And of course, I finished uh, Cambridge Friends School. I was the assistant head of school. Um, I was a public speaker. I love talk, talk about it. I believed in Dr. Martin Luther King to speak to schools, let them know that I was very, very proud, very honored by Dr. King. And so I would always speak at public schools. I spoke to over a hundred schools at um, um, Roxbury Latin, uh, Roland Park, Bullets, 
um, St. Louis, Minneapolis, Seattle, everywhere. I love to talk any place about public speaker. I loved it. And I also published author of many magazines and newspaper. I read, um, <coughs> excuse me, I had um, Boston Globe, uh, Providence Journal, and I also, I also um, taught independent school, NAIS, and I looked at NPR. So I love to read about things and ideas, and NPR was wonderful. I, I probably have spoken to, to 11 or 12 NPR schools because it was wonderful to talk about things. So um, you can hear from Michael's story that um, the common theme it was words and language, speaking, writing, reading. Um, so that was one reason that his stroke was um, so devastating, but also gave us so much hope that he, with his very, very strong language brain before, um, would be able to, um, to fight back from that. So very much me, very much on 21 May, 2016, Saturday morning, I woke up and said, hmm, today I probably get on a bicycle and bicycle from Providence to Worcester uh, and see my daughters, uh, Liza and Zachary uh, Rowe uh, in Worcester, uh, Worcester, uh, <laughs> about 50 miles, no problem. Of course, I hit with a stroke, I see my stroke and I was hospitalized by the Rhode Island Hospital. Uh, while I was there, um, I thought, okay, I have um, two days to get back to Cambridge Friends because I had to go to Washington, D.C. And so I talked to the, the people, my wife, Carolyn, and Carolyn, and um, Chris, and Betsy, I, I kept saying the same thing over and over, Katie Kessler, my sister-in-law, because I, they couldn't speak. And um, I had to speak, but um, it was three days there at Rhode Island Hospital, and I went up to uh, Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Royal Hill Rehabilitation in uh, Charlestown <coughs> is a beautiful place, absolutely gorgeous, nine or 10 stories. And I hated it. I absolutely hate the place. Um, I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to sneak out of that place. Uh, somehow schemize some ideas to go down the bus to get back to Barrington. But Spalding Rehabilitation is a beautiful place, but I just hate it. I wanted to go. I wanted to go home. Um, I could not speak or comprehend uh, simple sentences. I was very frustrated. I was in a wheelchair every time I left the house. They put me in a wheelchair. Very frustrating to me because I thought I got to get back to school. I got to get back and work. But um, instead of getting back to Cambridge Friends, I had to. I had. Um, received intensive speech therapy, a physical therapy, and occupational therapy. Every day was scheduled, every morning on my board, my clipboard, uh, whiteboard had all these things I had to do, nine o'clock here, or speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational, occupational therapy. And while there, I couldn't speak well, uh, I learned I had aphasia, I learned how to speak people understand me. Yes, you can advance the slide. We, um, so yeah, it was Ed Spalding. That was the first time that we'd ever heard the word aphasia. And this slide we can go through quickly because everyone in this audience, I'm sure, is very familiar with the definition. An acquired communication disorder that impairs a person's ability to process language but does not affect intelligence, which that but does not affect intelligence. Part of the definition uh, is really so important to us. Uh, Michael taught me the derivation of the word that A means not and thania speak. So the word was originally aphatos. I might be pronouncing that wrong. I apologize. Um, which eventually became the word aphasia, meaning speechless. So uh, after 37 days in spoiling rehabilitation, I got uh, Carolyn drove me down to Barrington, Rhode Island, and I was so happy to be out back in life. And um, I still went to Atwell's Avenue on Providence, Rhode Island, and lots of things I did with Mark Lafay and Brianna McGilley. Um One of the things I did was the URI Book Club under Kim, and I was so excited to be part of URI Book Club. And I was so excited about 
speaking about books. And so I remember reading the play, listening on, on audio or reading it. Uh, I thought of all great ideas in my mind. And one day uh, I had a practice, practice, practice. Excuse me. <laughs> and um, I thought I would say something for you are a book club. And I raised my hand, started Dr. Kim, and I spoke about you are a book club. And I spoke very eloquently, very eloquently, what I was supposed to say. And uh, no one said anything. I spoke for bro two minutes. And they looked at me and said, do you like ice cream? I said, oh my God. <laughs> so nothing was, was being tested. They wanted me to say something, but the URI book just, just they didn't ask me. I think, and I was frustrated a little bit, yes? Yeah, I think it was an ex that was an example connecting back to it's not an intellect thing and showing how frustrating it was for Michael because talking about literature was something that he was an, an expert with. Um, and um, But now with aphasia, he was uh, having to um, um, just having to realize that he, he wasn't able to communicate those high level um, thoughts anymore, which was really frustrating to him. So Rihanna McGilley, who went to BU uh, for a master, she said, Michael, try this place at Boston University. And I read it and I said, oh my God, I'll take the MBTA uh, from Providence to Boston, from the South Station to Green Line to 635 Commonwealth Avenue. And I, I, it was wonderful to leave Boston University. It was powerful, it was wonderful. Jerry Kaplan is a brilliant, is a wonderful man because of that. Boston University was great. I had a chance to take Toastmasters, uh, creative writing, uh, movie club, uh, music appreciation, all types of wonderful ideas, places to talk to people, intellect, intellectual reasons from Boston University. And it was wonderful. And I started to read or to write, and I published two of them. Uh, one of them, Gratitude to Blood and Thunder. And I read Blood and Thunder called Gratitude. And uh, I wrote it, it was wonderful. And I got published, and I was so excited. And I published more, and um, that was published in Blood and Thunder. And I, I learned that published uh, Blood and Thunder. I was so excited. I was so happy. In May 2017, I worked to write again, writing, 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 writing. I wrote one for NPR by Fred Reamer. Uh, this I Believe, I wrote about uh, this I Believe, about what improving, always improving, always improving. So I worked really hard. I wrote out what it looked like. Carolyn vetted the idea, and um, this I believe. I, I, I did um, three ideas through this I believe from 2017, 2018, 2019. Always this I believe. Okay, you can. <coughs> you want me to read? Sure. Okay, so. Um, um, Kind of in in watching Michael's discovery of poetry as uh, avenue for him to express himself, um, he would express to me how frustrated he was by his inability to make people understand what he was saying. Um, but when he wrote it in a poem and then shared it with people, uh, it was uh, people people got it and felt it and understood it in a way that didn't happen as well when he um, when he spoke. So um, Michael, do you want to describe the, the genesis of the gratitude poem, for example? So gratitude, uh, a very simple poem, talked about all things you do with a stroke. My left arm is, my left hand, left-handed person. With this ischemic stroke, my left hand is very weak and it's very frustrating. I couldn't zip up my own I can zip up one jacket so I can zip. And sometimes when I was a jacket, I had to work two, three, four minutes for zipping. And it's very frustrating. It's, it's, it, you're impotent. I'm just 
totally infinite from this. And things that go over so quickly, just flip through doing a zipping, but I can do any of them. <laughs> and so um, I was frustrated, but I wrote about it with gratitude and I learned how to zip up. Even, even tonight, for example, I have a little t-shirt, I have a, a, a shirt on, a, um, a sweatshirt, a um, dress shirt, and trying to tie over, try to, try to tie over my right hand, it takes a time, it takes about a minute or two minutes just to, just to button up. But um, it's very frustrating, but just do it. It's patience, it's being calm, it's just trying to do it every day. Know that I can do it every time. It will be hard, but at the time, every time. So gratitude expressed how I felt from, from that. You can go to the next slide, please. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, um, so Michael had always wanted to write a book even before, uh, in before his stroke. Um, and he, oh, yeah, no, you can go ahead and put it onto that next slide. And he, um, um, so, so the, what came out of it was his book, Finding My Poems, uh, Aphasia Poetry. So he spent a long time writing the poems. And then we went through a long process, and this was a collaborative process with some um, friends of ours, selecting which poems we would uh, would be in the published book. Michael wanted there to be 52 poems because Walt Whitman's um, Leaves of Grass has 52 poems and that, that corresponds to the 52 weeks in the year. Uh, so we had, he had written a lot more than 52. So we spent a lot of time going through those poems, voting on them, you know, making the decision about which, which ones would really work best in the collection. Um, then we spent um, a long time editing and editing was a, was a collaborative process also. Uh, where I worked with Michael and sometimes it was just frustrating and really hard for both of us um, because, um, well, I think that process is hard for anyone, but it was an additionally hard uh, having aphasia um, going through that. And then the formatting of the poems, deciding um, the order that we would <coughs> present them in, we, we just put a lot of thought into to every step of that process. I think we might be at the point now where we're going to share some poems. Oh, one last one. No, go ahead. So I write a poem each day. This continues speech therapy for me. As I go about a day, I filter my experience through poetry. I write poetry every day, every day, every day what I'm doing. Uh, in January, I write a poem every day of about almost 70 poems from this year, just poetry, just whatever I see, it's a, it's a, it's an experience for what poetry is. Okay, I think we might be ready to share some poems. Is that the next slide? Ooh. Okay, great. Who is gratitude? I've heard about it. Okay. So we have first... okay. This is a uh, gratitude. Fumbling my right arm, I slowly, gently try to make it right. Sweating, I can imagine the zipper sl sliding up. Fumbling, trembling, slowly. I will try. On 21 May 2016, I dreamed a dream. Only, I could not get up. I couldn't, I just couldn't. The dream was a reality. I couldn't walk, I fumbled my word. A world of words, Rokamaki, one letter, one time. Hamlet, graceful, but aphoristic. Hard words for me, words, words, words. A little more akin than less than kind. Heart of hearts. Ah, there's the rub. But no Hamlet. I labored him. Everyone moiled with hard. And I was. What does one say? Improving. Now, 
there's still the zipper. It is a large fluorescent north face refusing to follow any lead. Fumbling with my right hand, I have patience. Patience is a virtue. I swear and sweat, moving the small zipper. I work, flip with my left arm, but I'm okay. I tug and push it. I tug and pull again. Slowly, calmly, I have my zipper. Lightly and pressing, I can do it. Zip, zip, zip. Thank you. Now I will tie my shoes. The rest is silence. <laughs> this one is aphasia, aphasia. <laughs> Who's there? Nay, answer me. Stand yourself and unfold yourself. Or this, stand yourself and unfold. I think I have it right. Nay, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. I think these words from Shakespeare were clear as the light before. Now they are all around me, fumbling, humbling, stumbling, tumbling, all this work. I'm drowning here. All the words feel like they pull me down, 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 and I'm full of mud fills my mind speaking in all the mud slush through the fly field. Mud, 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 slowly, slowly, dilly-dallying, mud in a muck, oozing my words. I'm drowning here, I really am. Okay, let's start with words, but how will I use only the right? or right, is that right, or right, or correct, or is it Orville right, 1903? It is correct, I think, I don't know. Words, 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 lead, lead, wind, wind, bass, bass. Are these the words I'm looking for? May I please have tomorrow? I asked in the hospital. No answers. They didn't understand. Sigh. That's great to have her. <laughs> this is imprisoned on, um, I think, 30 June, 30 June 2016, 37 days. <coughs> I was, <clears throat> I was imprisoned. <clears throat> imprisoned. A bright, beautiful woman said to me, what, my friend, is it like with aphasia? I listened with sullenness, seeping down, thinking with anger, a rage, frustration, and everything, yes, would regurgitate as I'm anxious to feel, think, taste, flowering out explosives of fireworks, imagining words, 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 just brain as if imagining, joyous, cheerful, laughing a rib, a joke, a jape, a riff, smiling and laughing together a grin. Oh, but now aphasia, I am silent, fettered, shackled. Yes, I too am locked down with a closed hard steel imprisoning me sadly. But in my heart, I too can try to speak, thinking, expressing words. The readiness is all.
This is page 32, a bumper sticker. You have me at neuroplasticity. I laugh and so do you. Aphasia, silence, tongue tied, muffled. Let me explain with my notes. One second, let me see it. There, yes, I got it. Sometimes I think of the world <coughs> and I could be thinking, flowing, moving, dancing in a field, progressive tense. Now, yes, I can imagine it. Yes, it is, was beautiful. I can dream, I can elect, I have power. Yes, I can do this, watch me, global, Broca, mixed non-fluent, Wernicke, Lungu, anomic, progressive, primary progressive, aphasia. There are two million others learning to speak again. And yes, neuroplasticity. You had me hopeful, speechless. I hope. <laughs> This is page 33 in Good Company. I wonder about Dan Gilbert being struck, completely incapacitated. I wonder how his stroke felt. I wonder how Timmy Bruski was struck two times, oh my, once. Struggled, improved, played football, announcer, ESPN, and then, bam. I wonder how that would feel twice. I wonder about Miles Davis, who played a plaintive trumpet, wondering if he could do this. My, what a piteous yet melancholy song, kind of blue. Birth of Cool, Porgy and Bess, Catches of Spain, Bitches Brew, Miles Davis, 1926, 1991, Stroke. <coughs> I wonder about Winslow Homer, left and right, raising up the Gulf Stream, undertow, the lifeline snapped the whip in Kirby Pocket. She, uh, the 1991 World Series Hall of Fame. And I smiled with Kirby's, Kirby's win. I wondered at Marva's heroic Walt Whitman. He wrote dozens and dozens, Bees of Grass, two poems, Yes, The Open Road. Song of Myself, oh, Captain, my Captain. He had a severe, massive stroke. I wondered about Isabella Stewart Gardner, a collector, Woodrow Wilson, Richard Nixon, two presidents, such prominent people, all struck by stroke. I wonder about them all breathing working, struggling, improving. I listened and I wonder what will happen. <clears throat> Lag Niapie. Can you feel it? Kept in one room. 37 days imprisoned, sheltered. Look at my feeble hands. Left hand, I can hardly lift it. There I am, yes, fettered, locked up, spalding rehabilitation. I can smell flowers, rose sapid. I can feel tulips, lilacs, just waiting. 
to be out there, pausing. Then they freed me, immured me, released me. The sun opened mine eyes, and I was free. My wife unlatched the door. I opened, and I saw the mercing sun. It was June, and I pressed on the car window. Duncan, it was free. Starbucks, it was free. Chipotle, oh my, it was free. And everything was free. Beyond mine arms. Freedom. 37 days. Liberty, might I say, emancipation? Did Juneteenth happen? No matter, I was free and I was alive. The safe, beautiful, clean, warm, safe world, ready to spring. It's almost summer, yes. And begin new stepping tentatively with my weakened left arm and hopeful speech. <laughs> okay, and I have one more called Aphasia Please. I just wrote this one on 25 March, uh, early this week, last Friday, I guess it was. Aphasia Please. When speaking, aphasia is very hard. So I ask, implore, just a few questions. Speak slowly. When speaking, I can hear you. Speak simply. Kiss. Keep it simple, silly. Speak clearly. I can understand. Listen. When I am speaking, don't interrupt me. Patience, patience, and patience. Be kind, please. Give me a time to speak clearly, okay? Take a minute. Refresh, reboot, reload. Two million can hear too. Try to listen. I think that's it. I think that's it for the poems. Michael, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much for reading some of your poetry to us. Um, I just want to take a minute to read some of the wonderful comments in the comment section. Um, Michael is an incredible inspiration to us all. Um, gratitude was a good one. You're inspiring, Michael. Wonderful. Thank you for reading some of your poems to us. <clears throat> Sorry, so as a reminder to our live audience, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A chat. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a button that says Q&A. Michael and Carolyn, where can we find the book, Finding, Finding My Words? So you can find it um, pretty much anywhere books are sold, as they say. You can go on Amazon. If you just search for it on Amazon, it's there. Um, uh, but you could also go into your local bookstore and request it and they can order it um, and, and have it there in any other, you know, barnesandnoble.com, any electronic way of, of um, getting a copy of the book. Wonderful, thank you. So we have a, a question that was just submitted. It has a little story with it. Um, so I'm gonna read the story out loud. Um, I remember in nursing school being on the rehab floor, lots of people who had had strokes and seeing the whiteboard with the patient's schedule for the day, nonstop therapy. I hate to think of you being in that situation, hating being there, but I imagine people loved meeting you there even when you couldn't speak. Do you go back? So what was your relationship with the hospital staff? Um, we did go back. Um, we actually... So there were the 37 days when um, Michael was there. And yeah, it was a real, um, it was a powerful experience. I spent a lot of time there with him also. There was like a little bench that could kind of be a bed and I, I could sleep there. Um, and uh, 
we had different experiences because I felt like Michael was so well cared for that actually when it was time to leave and he was so excited about leaving, I, I was like the mom taking her baby home from the hospital for the first time saying, we're not ready. Like we're not ready to leave having all this constant support and knowing that, um, that somebody's, uh, that somebody's right here. So, um, um, we, then Michael did a, um, I think it was six weeks long. There was a um, intensive aphasia program at Spalding um, in September. So his, his stroke was in May. And then in September, he went back. It was five or six weeks long and it was four days a week and it was all day. And there was some intensive, intensive speech therapy involved, but there was also, they would put him on those um, bikes, those trike bikes and um, they could ride bikes. And there was, um, there was some art and there were some other things that they were doing. Um, we, we got to be quite close with his speech therapist, especially, and we're really excited to see her whenever we went back to, um, um, to visit. Um, and then he did some very studies. So went back um, for those and we would look for the people who had been his, his therapist while he was there, but we haven't been in, yeah, some, some, some of the therapists were, his, his speech therapist was amazing. Um, she, she was one of the first people to work with him and um, she was asking Michael, this is, I think, a typical, I guess, question for people who have had a stroke. She was asking him to, telling him a time and asking him to draw the hands on a clock. And he was very confused by what she was asking him to do and his ability to do it. So at one point he just stopped and said, um, I don't know, do you know who won the Super Bowl in 1986 or something like that? And she said, no. And then, so, that she switched her tactics and the, um, the next, thing, then she started working with Michael on, she asked him to make a list, he was practicing his writing. She asked him to make a list of the Super Bowl winners for every single Super Bowl. Um, so she was honoring his intelligence and something that a great strength of his that he knew so much about, um, but also, you know, using that as therapy, getting him to write and getting him to express in word, you know, to put that into complete sentences you know, and that kind of thing. Um, then on the other side, he had a physical therapist who really had a very <coughs> low bar for what he could do and would clap for him when he got out of his wheelchair and walk it across a mat. And uh, he was just disgusted by that whole thing and was not, you know, that was just frustrating to him. Um, so, yeah. That was the worst part of this, that they were willing to clap everyone, clap, clap, clap everything. And I was so frustrated. I mean, everything I had done was fairly intellectual with uh, Roxbury Latin or Paul Cuffey or Cambridge Friends, uh, William Penn Charter. Uh, I had really intelligent ideas about ideas. I had real ideas. And people were, were saying, yay. That was very frustrating. I mean, one of my days of spoiling rehabilitation, I was with everyone, about six or seven people with a stroke. And they're just passing each other, passing a tennis ball along the, uh, to table uh, to table. And I was mad. I could be, I was so mad. And I guess I told Carolyn, I said, you got you can't do that, Michael. I'm not sure you can have him around. I didn't hear that part, but I was I was just so angry because I said, let me get let me go. I have things to do. I gotta get back to Cambridge friends. Let's go. Because I, I had talked his way into being a part of this group. I don't know if they didn't have room for him or something else. So we went to the group and I was like, no, no, he loves it. He's very social. He's gonna love being a part of this. And he was they were playing a game where they would roll a ball to somebody across the table and then that person was supposed to say something. And Michael just let the ball roll past them, just stared at everybody in just those <laughs> angry ways that they said to me after they were like, No, we don't think that he wants to be in this group. So it, but I think it was coming to terms with, um, um, you know, he just, he just, he, he's literally said to me, he's like, I hate that group. I hate those people. And it, that what obviously wasn't what it was. He didn't know those people, but he, um, he didn't want to be there and he didn't want to have to be, um, you know, working on things like that, like struggling to come up with a sentence when a ball was passed to him. Um, so it definitely took some time to sort of get past that. I think we more than, I, I don't know if we answered your question, but we, that just triggered all our memories <laughs> of that time in Spalding. <laughs> in Lindor. Oh. <laughs> that was wonderful, thank you. So actually a good friend, Deborah from Stroke Onward is um, waving hello, um, virtually waving hello. And so I thought it might be a good time to talk about um, your upcoming projects and some of the things that you have coming up soon. 
Well, uh, Deborah Meyerson, I'm so happy to see that. Deborah Meyerson, uh, Steve Zuckerman, um, Whitney Hardy, and I, and uh, Wendell Burson, the five of us, we're going to cycle across America, starting in uh, Portland, Oregon, to travel between Oregon 100 days back to Boston University. Um, I couldn't start until um, June 3rd because my son Jackson is a senior at uh, Bates College. So I'm gonna fly out to Missoula, Montana, about 15 days, three to 2022. I will cycle from Missoula, Montana to um, Wyoming, Idaho, yeah, exactly. Wyoming, Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, Nebraska on 4th of July, Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas, Illinois, Indiana, um, Michigan, Ontario, New York, and Massachusetts. About 85 days will take me. And when this is done about eight o'clock, I gotta go back to rowing again. And that's what I have in mind. We're doing Stroke Across America. We're very excited by this. I'm very anxious. I'm very worried by this. Uh, I'm making $10,000. And um, right now I'm about 5,500, but I'd love to see people give, give to me to do that. <laughs> it's a GoFundMe. Yeah, I just want to say that um, Deborah Meyerson's book, Identity Theft, was one of the inspirations. Michael and I both read that book, and that was one of the, uh, that was just an inspiration for Michael to write, to write his book, because he thought, I, I need to express this experience too in a very different way, you know, um, through the poetry. And he's also just so excited about this opportunity um, from um, Deborah and Steve's organization, Stroke Onward, uh, this awareness raising bike ride. I don't know if you have it, but Channel 10 is a two minutes, is a 747, is a two minute of um, channel news by Barbara Morris that explain what we're doing that's really inspirational and um, it's fantastic. Like after this, it'll be lights out. My wife and I, Carol, will go upstairs and stroke for an hour. Uh, very tired, but I gotta do it again just to, to be ready, be ready to do it. I am mean, so excited, it's so wonderful that a stroke person can do this. And it's exciting and um, it's exciting. It's very exciting. It's very exciting and very inspirational. Do you guys mind if I share your GoFundMe? Oh, no, of course not. We don't mind at all. <laughs> Please, GoFundMe. <laughs> so I'm going to put the GoFundMe in the link. Uh, sorry, the GoFundMe link in the chat. I'm also going to bring it up on my screen for a second, just to show you what it looks like. So oh, yes. hey. if you go to GoFundMe.com and then do a search for Stroke Across America, um, it's the first link that pops up and this is what it looks like. So we're halfway there. <laughs> Let's get all the way there. Oh God, yes. <laughs> and when does this uh, when does this GoFundMe end? Well, um, we don't know exactly. We have to set it. We, we have to we have to talk on, to Deborah and Steve about that. On three <laughs> April. I'm on, on there are five of us on it. Uh, Arlene Hall, Arlene Hall, Deborah Meyerson, Steve Zuckerman, um, uh, Whitney Hardy and someone else. We're going to talk on 3 April Sunday for about an hour and a half, two hours, where we are. And I'd like to see $10,000 by um, May 31st. Before I fly out, I have to fly out to Missouli, have my uh, bicycle flown out to uh, Montana. And I hope it'll be about $10,000 so to get everything out there. So I'm hoping they'll do that. And I'm very anxious. I mean, I'm used to making charities. When I used to be a teacher, I could always have people give me $20,000 to do Robin Ride for Kids. <coughs> so um, I hope people will give us money right now. Very anxious, but we'll do it now. I think we'd all really appreciate it. It's a really <clears throat> wonderful moment, moment for aphasia awareness. So if you could donate, um, if you're joining us on YouTube, you can find these links in the description box. Okay, so we have some more questions coming in. Um, let me see. Thank you. 
Thank you for, for funding. Thank you very much for money. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so it looks like we have a question from our live audience. Um, this person says, thank you for reading some of your poetry. I was wondering how long it took uh, for you to get your voice back. Sorry if I missed this question, if it was answered sooner. What can you offer as a motivational tool to help someone with aphasia to work on their speech? Um, so... Yeah, because as Michael described, he did go from, when he was at Rhode Island Hospital, this was a line in one of his poems, he pretty much just kept repeating over and over again, can I please have tomorrow? He just kept saying it again and again. And we were like, sure, yes, you can have tomorrow. But we did not, what he was saying was, can I please get out of here and leave and be back to work by tomorrow? Um, but uh, so that, that, was, that was kind of where he started. Um, and Michael has something called fluent aphasia. So pretty soon after that, when he was at Spalding, he was able to, um, the act of speaking wasn't really, you know, he, he could get the words out, but they would often be in the wrong order or um, there was a comprehension piece. So he often wasn't answering the question that was asked um, or um, just, just kind of uh, going a different direction. What I think really helped him was the fact that even though he knew that was the case and a lot of the time he was saying things that people weren't understanding, he did not stop. Michael was a very verbal person before and a very, very social person who, you know, a person who would like chat, chat, chat with the waitress at any time at the restaurant, just anyone that he met, just talk to, find out, you know, where they went to college, what they did, what they just would ask questions and have a conversation. So even with aphasia, he didn't stop that and he kept, to, and he would say to people, I, I'm sorry, I have aphasia, you might understand me, but he just, he just plowed through. So he, he kept, um, he kept practicing just like putting himself out there and speaking a lot, which, um, I, you know, I really respect because I think that that would be a hard thing to do. But I think that that was one thing that helped. And he found so there are so many resources out there. First, we didn't know of very many. Um, but um, through that Boston University Aphasia Resource Center, so many um, um, resources through that. We found a lot of things in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, and now through Zoom, so many opportunities um, that don't require insurance money for speech therapy um, to, to be involved in different things. So um, yeah, I think, I don't know, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Thank you. So Carolyn, earlier you talked um, about Bruce Willis and you had talked about how a diagnosis of aphasia affects the whole family. Can you talk a bit more about your experience as a care partner? Sure. Um, yeah, I do. I do feel that that's the case. It wasn't something that just happened to Michael. It was something that happened to me and that happened to our kids. We have three kids, um, college age. And um, um, you know, it, it, it changed a lot of, it, it, it changed um, a lot, it changed my identity in ways that, um, um, that I wasn't necessarily, like, I didn't necessarily realize how, how big a change it was going to be um, to like a, a different way of supporting Michael and um, advocating for him, you know, in, in small ways, you know, bigger ways advocating for people with aphasia, but advocating for Michael and making sure um, that people, uh, the people understood him. It's, it's kind of complicated. Once I was in one of the um, aphasia research group community groups and um, someone whose husband also had a stroke said something that I really connected with. She said she really disliked the term caregiver. Um, and she just wanted to continue to refer to her husband as her husband. Um, because it's true, now I am Michael's care partner, and now there are areas where I need to give him support, but there also continue to be a lot of areas where he gives me support, and there's just a lot more to our relationship of our marriage of 26 years than the fact that he had, you know, that he had a stroke and that I'm his care partner. So there's that piece, but I would say um, <coughs> specific to aphasia, it's been a learning curve for me also to and something I feel like I work on every day and sometimes I'm not great at is um, when to uh, step in and either try to explain to somebody else what he's saying um, or um, 
explain to him what, what I hear him saying that isn't right and try to get him to um, understand that and say it the right way and when to step back and to, uh, you know, just um, trust in the fact that, um, trust in the people that he's talking to, that they don't need me to translate for him and also that that he is going to get there. So I'm a very, I'm, I'm also a pretty verbal talkative person and my thoughts jump around and a sentence can find it, you know, somewhere far away from where it started. And so it's really helped me. Um, again, I'm still working on it, but living with Michael and interacting with Michael has helped me to be more clear in my speech, which actually has been a great learning experience for me. I'm a college professor. I think that's helped me there too, that I'm, um, so, so it's really been a, you know, it, it, it's, been a challenge, but it's been a good partnership, and there are um, a lot of really important things that I've learned and taken away from the experience as well. Thank you. Um, Michael, would you say Toastmasters is good for people with aphasia? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I've, done, I've, 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 I've written about 100 Toastmasters. I've written about 100 speeches. I've written since, since 2000. 18, I used to take the bus and take the T, the MBTA uh, from Providence to Boston, about 45 miles. And I'd walk across South Station or um, Back Bay Station to the Green Line to um, Commonwealth Avenue, 635, and start at 10 30 in the morning. And uh, then COVID 19, 2020. We've moved to Zoom since uh, March 2020, about two years. And I've done Toastmasters every day, every once a week. Uh, I love it. Just uh, I love, love doing it. Mine is less is more because I often write to Toastmasters and it'd be about five or six, seven minutes long. And Jerry Kaplan said, too long, too long. So I try now to do it in very short, about 20 minutes, see what I've done. Uh, I love Toastmasters. I to think about what it might be, what to say, whatever it is, I can write about it. I love it. Toastmasters is awesome. Every day, write something. It's wonderful. That's that's the group that he's done most consistently. <coughs> at the PU group. I think pretty much every time since he started. Um, it's been really good. Um, we have a question. Michael, can you share what you do every day with your musings? Great, thank you. We're about 450 people. It started uh, five and a quarter a year. It's back in December 2016. Margaret Fay was working with me uh, at Wills Avenue in Providence. And uh, as in December, he said, write down in words uh, what it is to do it. It was uh, going to, uh, to see a Christmas tree at a place, uh, was it Lafayette? La Salette. La Salette, La Salette in um, Massachusetts. And I wrote it down and um, Mark Fay read it. It was awful. It was the worst thing I've ever seen. I was so embarrassed. I cried, so upset. So I went home <coughs> and started writing a musings. It started every day, about 20 people from Middlebury College to my friends, like. Harden and Wendy Pantle and Chris Sinton and Chris Summerscale, Claire Jones, Karen Hammers, about 20 people. And Cara said, hey, add me. And so it add, everyone asked me, Katie said, add me. So um, they'd asked me and it's now 475 people or about 450, 475 people uh, every day, every day, every day since 2016. It's my writer, what happened that day? So today, it changed resources and omelet, men, omelet I made this morning for breakfast and uh, education resources with Jerry Kaplan. Great one with Elizabeth Hindinger. Read about her. She's Elizabeth Hindinger, who I saw on this, is uh, she has stroke too, hemorrhagic uh, thing about 10, 12 years ago. We talked about that. And um, I napped a little bit. And I went for a haircut and um, I write about it. And now that I write about rowing, I just love everything I've done. Everything I've done 
I write every day since then. So it's basically like a little, like a journal of his day. And he also starts each one with a poem that he finds, not that he um, wrote. Sometimes he will include a poem that he wrote. Um, but uh, I think a lot of people tune into the musings every day to see what the poem is because he um, just has a really, just a huge collection of all kinds of poems and they often connect to something uh, going on. In March, uh, the National Women's Month, so every play is for a woman. And in February, National Black History in February. So now April will be Walt Whitman's start. <laughs> April and, and, poetry month. and how can uh, anyone in our audience join that list to hear more of your musings or read more of your musings? Well, uh, I give you the Gmail, but um, yes, I think we'll do that. But um, my email is just uh, my friend Denise Lowell, who had aphasia. <coughs> Excuse me, I wrote it. And she wrote back and said, Michael, you sent me four texts to it. I said, oh my God. So I'm going through my old, my old uh, musings, about 475 of them. And uh, I'm trying to make it just right. But uh, it's, I put it down my, my name. And uh, I think, it'll change to uh, the blog, B-L-O-G, because I just look at a blog and talk about it. Uh, right now, it's Stroke Across America. Uh, I'll write a poem every day and about cycling, all the beautiful Nebraska and Indiana and Illinois and sunset. It'll be great. I we'll be really excited to, to hear more about your, your adventures across oh, America. Oh, wonderful. But actually, we have one quick question. Are you not going to visit the Bay Area on your trip across America? Um, no. Missoula, Montana. Well, it depends. If I make, if I make money on GoFundMe, like $10,000 or $11,000, I might be able to fly back to San Francisco and have a celebration in early May. So I can fly out to San Francisco and fly back to Boston, but Carolyn rolls her eyes. But <laughs> I make eleven thousand dollars. I was to say, take it over and go home. Yes, yeah, uh, so we got to hit that goal, guys. <laughs> um, so yeah. we are actually just about out of time. I want to ask one last question, Michael and Carolyn. Uh, if you could leave our audience with just one message, what would that message be? So your final thoughts. Um. Um, I guess it just comes back to that piece about um, um, well, for me, I think that aphasia is a huge thing and it's a huge part of Michael, but it's it, it's not everything. And um, to whether it's Michael or somebody else with aphasia, um, that that like respect and honor for the person who's there is, um, you know, as long as that underlies interaction with the person with aphasia, I, th I think that's really, uh, I think that's, yeah, <laughs> that's what I would leave you with. Patience, practice, prayer, it's all on you. Patience, practice, prayer, uh, just do it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing so much of yourselves and your lives with us. Um, to our wonderful audience, thank you guys for joining us today and uh, so leaving so many really wonderful comments in the chat box. Um, I'm going to give some time to Michael and Carolyn to read those over. Um, but before I do so, I want to quickly share some upcoming Ask the Expert webinars. So on April 14th, we will have a conversation with Dr. Howard Kirshner, who is a board certified behavioral and vascular neurologist and a professor of neurology at Vanderbilt <laughs> University Medical Center about cognition. On May 12th, we'll have a conversation with Dr. Sharon M. Antonucci about animal assisted interventions. So bring your pets with you that day. Um, we also have some wonderful online groups. Um, we have our Book Club, Books, Us, and More. Um, that meets every Thursday. We also have a Spanish book club that meets every Tuesday. We have Black American Aphasia Conversation Group, which is actually led by Michael. 
Um, that's a bi-weekly conversation group that discusses the unique challenges and gifts that Black Americans with aphasia share from experience with disability and race. We also have professionals with Aphasia Connect, which is a peer-led conversation group for professionals with aphasia. Um, we have two new groups, Journey Through Aphasia, which is a monthly peer-led conversation group to discuss all things related to travel. Um, that group is filling up quickly. So if you would like to join that group, I really encourage you to uh, sign up as soon as possible. You can sign up by emailing me, jen at aphasia.org. We also have Parenting with Aphasia, which is a monthly group that invites parents with kids of all ages to join together and share experiences about parenting with aphasia. This group is hosted by Lauren Schwabish, who is a speech language pathologist with NeuroSpeech Services in Northern Virginia. If you would like to join any of those groups, please visit us at aphasia.org slash online dash events. For more information on stroke across America, uh, please visit strokeonward.org. Um, and to support Michael's Stroke Across America ride, go to gofundme.com. Um, and in the search bar, you can search for Stroke Across America. For any comments, questions, or suggestions, please email me at jen at aphasia.org. I'll be putting that in the chat. Thank you again so much for joining us. Have a great day.